it's a it's an honor to introduce uh, one of my librettists of uh, two of my operas and one of America's greatest lib librettists. Um, actually, um, I would say America's celebrity librettist. Uh, and so uh, Jean Shear uh, has um, written librettos for uh, many of today's leading composers. He is uh, also a great songwriter, words and music. Jean is also a singer and an actor, started out as, as a musical theater performer in Europe, and we'll hear more about that. Jean's written for uh, singers such as Joyce DiDonato, Renee Fleming, Denise Graves, Stephanie Blythe, Sylvia McNair, Fred Derica von Stada, Nathan Gunn, Patti LaBelle has performed his work and Nora Jones has. So um, we'll, we'll find out a lot more about Gene tonight, but it's really a pleasure to welcome you, Gene, uh, to Tulsa Opera Live. Hi there. Hi, Gene. It's great it's to see good you. Good to be with you. So um, we, we uh, are curious about I'm curious to hear the story, which I haven't heard in 25 years, of mm -hmm. your journey from Eastman School of Music uh, to, uh, to a performer in Europe. Can you tell us a little about that? Well, sure. Well, first of all, it's a pleasure to be here with you and with Tulsa Opera. So I'm really, really thrilled to get a chance to, to share some of these stories and also to reconnect with Tobias, who is, in addition to being a brilliant composer, is a dear friend. Um, I did start out as a, as a singer, uh, a singer wannabe. I, I wanted to be an opera, operatic baritone. I went to the Eastman School of Music in Rochester, New York. And I was planning to, uh, to have a career uh, as an opera singer. Uh, but, you know, being an opera singer, as many of you know, is like being an Olympic athlete. It's very, very difficult to uh, make that final cut. Uh, but of course, I didn't know that when I, when I was starting out. Uh, so I, after, after school, after getting my master's degree at Eastman, I went off to Europe to become an opera singer. And um, I, uh, in short, I, I was auditioning, but not, you know, not quite making the cut. Uh, I was a good actor. And uh, the way the story goes is I was studying with a very uh, wonderful uh, accompanist named Eric Verbo, who is Christo Ludwig's accompanist. I was studying leader with him at the time and I got a phone call. I had done some cabaret somewhere and I got a phone call from someone who said, uh, uh, would you consider doing uh, auditioning for him being in? We'd like to, we think you'd be great in this tour we're doing of Jesus Christ Superstar, uh, a, European, uh, uh, a European tour. And I said, look, I'm an, I, I'm an opera singer. Uh, I'm an artist. I see myself doing The Count and The, uh, the Marriage of Figaro and other roles like that. And they said, well, it pays 2,500, uh, you know, Deutschmarks a week. And I said, one second, I'll put Mr. Shear on the phone. <laughs> and I, I, I got the job and I took the job and I continued to study uh, classical singing, thinking I was just one voice teacher away. I wound up writing a song about that. Just one voice teacher away from, uh, from making it all work. Uh, but meanwhile, I was working in the theater um, and uh, going from one uh, show to another. I did some long runs of shows, as I said, continuing to study and, and thinking that I would uh, would do it. Would I would uh, make that transition? Did you do just, cats in? You did cats in Russia? I did. I did cats in Russia. I, I, I was at Teatro Devin, which is a very prominent theater, which uh, appropriately now is back doing opera. But in the 1980s, it was doing musical theater. And after Jesus Christ Superstar, I got an audition um, uh, for Cats. And I was very, uh, I was, uh, I wasn't that keen on the show, but I was very keen on the job, honestly. And it was an incredible experience. I just had a wonderful time there. And Teatro and Devin, as Tobias just mentioned, uh, that company, which was the third company in the world, was asked to go to Russia. And I, you know, being a man of the theater, I had a good idea, which we were doing it in, in Vienna, I was doing it in German. Uh, but in Russian, in Russia, we were doing it in English. But I was playing Gus the theater cat. And I said, you know what I'm gonna do? I'm gonna get my number translated into Russian, which was a really smart, you know, smart move. So the show was going along in English in, Mo in Moscow. And all of a sudden I go, 
not say no, Niras Pakanatu Shagal, and the crowd went crazy. It was my 15 seconds of fame. And uh, so I had this, this, uh, this really fun moment. Uh, anyway, so I, I did all these different shows and continuing to think I was going to be uh, uh, an opera singer. And I was writing along. You studied with Pat Meislin. Was yeah, that's where I was going with this. When I came back to the when I came back to the states, I had studied with various teachers, and I was studying with Pat Mislin, uh, who is a wonderful, wonderful voice teacher who taught, who taught Renee Fleming, Stephanie Blythe, uh, Maggie Lattimore, all these wonderful uh, singers. And I studied. This was I was now in. I was I spent about a decade in Europe. And when I came back, um, when I was studying with Pat. She said to me one day after studying with her for three or four months, I was about 35 years old. And she said, she says, Jean, she spoke, she was very, very, she is very, very smart, but talks in a very down home kind of way. And she said, you know, Jean, I can make you better, but not that much better. Keep the hundred bucks. Let's go have coffee. You should write your songs. You write nice songs. So um, uh, I, and people have always people have asked me, was I devastated? And truthfully, I was relieved because it's such a hard, um, it's such a hard uh, task uh, to be very good, but not good enough. I, I mean, and that's the thing. If I had, if I had been terrible, it would have been uh, an easy, you know, an easy uh, choice. I was like, I always say I was like a triple A baseball player. I couldn't quite hit the, uh, hit the fastball in the major leagues. Anyway, so that's, your, that, that's how my story uh, sort of unfolded. You're singing, there's your, your singing uh, ability and musical Mastery really enabled you to 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 uh, en enrich your your work as a librettist, which um, which is impressive. You you've we're, we won't talk about the future projects, which are very exciting. They're not announced yet, but we'll start uh, with your most recent premiere and work our way back um, to you. You most recently premiered. It's a wonderful life. Mm -hmm. Houston Grand Opera uh, in 2016, Jake Heggie's opera. And um, could you introduce that, uh, talk a little bit about that for us? Sure, uh, the Houston Grand Opera had, uh, uh, a part of their agenda was to do holiday themed operas. And so they commissioned uh, various people to write holiday themed operas. And uh, they asked Jake and Jake suggested uh, It's a Wonderful Life. And I loved the movie. Uh, it was it was very it was, honestly it was a very daunting difficult uh, task to make that into an opera, uh, but um, over time I think we we accomplished it. The, the pictures you're seeing are from uh, as Tobias just said we're from Houston. And there's Bill Burton who's such a wonderful wonderful singer, um, and uh, just a great great and Rod Gilfrey there, and it was you know so we had a wonderful cast. And what happened was. Um, uh, as is the case with uh, well, lots of modern operas. Um, I think this piece needed a little chance to grow. It was, we reworked it a lot for San Francisco, uh, which was one of the co-commissioners. And uh, while I was happy with it in Houston, honestly, I really thought it really, it, it hit its stride in, uh, in, uh, in San Francisco, uh, in large measure because of how we rewrote it. And, and also because the production was significantly changed. Uh, but it, the, pic, the piece grew and I, I really have grown to love it uh, in its current uh, iteration. It's, it's really, it's a beautiful piece. Of course, we all know the, the, the film from Capra and it's a very- you know, Jimmy Stewart, uh, Jimmy Stewart, Stewart movie and Donna Reed. And before Donna that, Reed. Uh, before that, you, pre you premiered uh, jo uh, Joby Talbot's Everest in Dallas Opera. Right, this was uh, the Dallas Opera wanted to work with Joby Talbot and they wanted to, uh, uh, pair him with someone who was uh, experienced, i.e. old, <laughs> someone who had, who had done this before. So they sent me to uh, meet with him. He was, had done a lot of ballet, uh, very large scale ballets for Covent Garden and such. And uh, I suggested the Into Thin Air story. Um, and uh, I think that this is an opera which really, I think uh, came together really, really beautifully. And it's a beautiful set, as you can see, there's Kevin Burdett, uh, the set was really kind of extraordinary, I thought, um, I forget, maybe. And uh, it's an amazing story. And, and the way it worked was rather than using John Krakauer's book, I went around the country um, and around the world through Skype, but around the country physically. And I met the survivors of that 1996 expedition. I interviewed them and I based the libretto on, on those interviews. So it was a very interesting uh, and uh, 
and and gratifying project actually. And um, it's having it's it, it, the piece is having a nice life. It's going to be at the Barbican um, in concert form uh, when it was supposed to be, but uh, that they rescheduled it because of COVID. Great, and be and that same year, uh, Cold Mountain by Jennifer Higdon premiered mm -hmm. at Santa Fe Opera. Yeah, Jennifer. Yeah, this is a uh, this is a shot with Nathan Gunn uh, uh, there, and it's uh, it's you know it was it's Jennifer asked me to write uh, an opera. Uh, there's Isabel Leonard and uh, Emily Fons, uh, both wonderful wonderful singers uh, who did a, a terrific job with it. Uh, and I suggested Cold Mountain to uh, Jennifer, and uh, uh, and uh, you know we, we we the piece is. Had a nice life. It's had, I think, four or five outings now, and uh, hopefully there was more scheduled. But again, COVID uh, intervened. Uh, so this was, uh, that was preceded by um, by another another Jake Heggy collaboration of uh, Moby Dick in at the Dallas Opera, right? In the right, of the Dallas Opera. There's Jonathan Lamalo, Stephen Costello, on the on the ship of the Pequod, and uh, this was. Uh, uh, Directed by Lenny Folia, who did a terrific job. This is one of these. I don't. Want, I, I don't think I dare call it iconic shots of it, but it's a really beautiful. It was a beautiful idea of Robert Brill, the designer, and Lenny's to uh, set the uh, boats in that the way they did. And there's Talise uh, and Bob Orth, the great Bob Orth, who unfortunately has has uh, passed on. Uh, I miss him terribly. Uh, but it was it was a wonderful experience and a wonderful night. It was a the show. There's Ben Hepner, and uh, it was great working with Ben, who is of course one of the great uh, opera singers. And um, it, it was uh, you know it was a challenging uh, story to tell in different ways. Each each piece has its own particular challenges we can which we can talk about. But this was uh, this was a very gratifying production. I also think that. Uh, the production team and uh, led by Leonard Folia did a really good job with this and the singers were great. And uh, uh, there's Steve, have, and such a beautiful voice. We have um, some shots from Three Decembers, which which was another Jake opera that premiered in 08. Right, this, this, right, this the premiered in Houston. This is from the most recent production. There's Susan Graham, the great Susan Graham on the left. Uh, uh, this was in San Jose, uh, just around December. Uh, and it's a it's a chamber piece. It's uh, written for nine, uh, I think, eleven instruments. And in fact, in that production uh, during COVID, they did it with two pianos. Uh, uh, and it's it's it started in Houston, and uh, the piece uh, was originally premiered with uh, Frederica von Stade in the lead. And uh, it's based on a Terence McNally a play. It was really just a a, 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 a slender. Uh, sort of theater piece that that uh, Terence wrote for an event uh, for an AIDS benefit, and it it, it was about uh, this family caught up in uh, in the AIDS pa pandemic over three uh, decades, and um, and so it, it required, as I said earlier, every project has its own particular challenges. In this case, Terence didn't write it as a play. With a beginning, middle, and end, you know, uh, he he really wrote it as a reading to be done, and it had this illustrious, you know, uh, cast when it was read uh, at this benefit with Cherry Jones and Victor Garber and such. Uh, but I had to expand it and uh, sort of reinvent the reinvent the piece. But luckily, I'm happy to report that Terence was was pleased. He told me he couldn't tell what he wrote and what I wrote, so that made me feel good. And before that, you had your your uh, was our second collaboration. We did American Tragedy. Well, uh, uh, this is this was one met in 2005. This is yeah. the Glimmer Glass. Glimmer Glass production. Production. Well, this was needless to say, this was one of the highlights of my life. Uh, getting to work with you, Tobias, and work on this uh, on this source <coughs> American Tragedy, for, of course, for the Metropolitan Opera, and um, it was. It was a it was a thrill. I, I we're seeing the production from Glimmerglass, which was just terrific. Peter Cazares did such a great job staging it, and uh, and you know we did uh, a lot of uh, reworking uh, of the piece um, or some reworking of the piece, I should say. But I I'm really okay, I was, was a lot of, a lot of re, we really changed it. I mean we did yeah. a lot of 
yeah. cutting after the Met in those yeah. nine that's years. That's great. It was, I remember that night. It was, such, it was a fun, it was such a fun uh, experience. You know, it was a, it was it was a really special uh, a special piece, and there's Ruth Bader Ginsburg and Oliver Sacks, and uh, it was a it was a hell of a night. Uh, it was quite a time, yes. It really was. Um, yeah, I mean, before, and then before the that, the, the, oh, that's our bow at the Met. At the Met, yeah, that was great. Uh, yeah, there's Susan uh, Graham again in the background there. Uh, there's Francesca Zambello, the uh, uh, the director of American Tragedy at the Met, and there I am with uh, with brown hair. <laughs> mm -hmm. There I am and with I, brown hair. I said, "Yeah, yeah. No, I, I don't have a white beard yet." Either. Yeah. So before that, we um, was your first opera, right? Was Therese Raquin when I when yeah. we worked first together, right? And that was a. This is from I think the press conference at the French Embassy before we even premiered it, right? It's funny, you know, Tobias, I work at the uh, New York Society Library. That's where I go to write when before COVID. And it's on 79th Street and right by the uh, that French consulate or that whatever that is. And I, I walk I past it all the time. Uh, uh, I was walking past it all the time and thinking about this that day. So it was, uh, I mean, I felt so incredibly lucky to have had that job with you, Tobias. This was a great production. This was in Chicago. And Ken Kazan did it, and I I just thought this was rocking. I thought this was uh, terrific. Uh, uh, That's uh, Ed Ed. Um... Uh, yeah, Ed, uh, and uh, it was just, it was so it was such a beautiful production, so well acted, so uh, just I just thought it was they did a great they did a terrific job, and of course it was it, we had this incredible cast when we when we started it out when we started out with you know with Diana Soviero and. Uh, and uh, all these wonderful, wonderful and, uh, yeah, and yeah, Richard uh, Bernstein. It was great. So we, we've been very, very fortunate uh, with the piece, and um, and there's more to come, which is very exciting as well with the piece. Yes, but Therese is going back to your is going to be have its uh, its Austrian premiere in Vienna in December at your old theater. Catherine. I just can't tell It's just, it's, it's surreal and it's so incredibly wonderful. That's where I had my first, you know, big uh, job in musical theater where I was doing, you know, doing cats there, but uh, you know, I, I was living five minutes or a five minute walk from, uh, from the theater. I got to learn to speak German well at the time and, uh, uh, and I knew everyone at the theater and the idea to go back with our piece, Tobias, is so incredibly uh, gratifying to me. It's just- I have to go and see it, well, definitely. You have to go. go, it just, it's, you know, COVID, you know, if COVID allows, I, def I definitely- Well, by then, I think- I think, I think, we're, I think by December, we should have our vaccinations. They're ready to be but ready we, to- When we start working on the, that piece in 98 or something, I, 99, 98 or something. I don't, I don't know. I do remember how it happened though. I was, over, I went over, Nathan Gunn set up a meeting with Francesca Zambello uh, uh, to just for just sort of an introductory meeting. And I, and I showed her about 20 songs that I had written when I was in Vienna. And I had a libretto that I had written for a sort of a musical opera uh, uh, hybrid piece based on measure for measure. Nothing ever happened with that piece, but I had something to show her. I always tell that to young people, like, you know, if you want to do it, do it, have something to show. And um, she read it and she liked it enough. And she liked me. And she said she knew that you were looking for a librettist and she introduced me to you. And then that started this whole uh, wonderful collaboration and these pieces and friendship. So it's it was a um, I was very, very fortunate. And also, as we all know, whatever career you're in, getting that first big job. And, and my job, Therese, with you, Tobias, was my first big job, make no mistake. Uh, uh, it's, it's hard to get someone to give you a chance. And uh, so uh, I felt incredibly uh, gratified. And, you you, know, did, you I, gave me a great libretto and it just, it sang, your libretto sang. Right. And the, as librettos have to, yeah. in order to be set. And, um, and it, it, it brought, it brought the best music I could write out of yeah, me. So yeah. that's what a libretto should do for the composer. It's a, it's a brilliant libretto and it's been done quite a lot. It was done 
was even done in French, remember, in Montreal. Mm -hmm. and, um, in London, so they, Covent Garden? They have not they... asked for it to be done in German. In Vienna, I'm glad to say, they'll, yeah. they'll use subtitles and do it in the original language. Mm -hmm. So we, uh, we, we have a little clip from the ghost story of Therese. Do you want to just set that up? It's, uh, it's, it's to me, uh, <laughs> so I'll let you set it up. Well, the, the, it's a story of uh, uh, this, uh, of a love triangle and the two people who are in love with each other uh, wind up murdering uh, the husband and the husband comes back as a ghost. Uh, uh, they, it's about their guilt. It's about many things, but it's about uh, their guilt and they can sort of run, but they can't hide from what they've done. And uh, in this, uh, I think it's pretty self-explanatory they're in bed and they are visited by the ghost of, uh, of uh, Therese's husband, uh, Camille. And uh, I think that sort of, sort of gives you the background you need to see the clip. So much fun seeing it again. Yeah, it, uh, Gordon Geats and Dame, what was her, uh, that gra the great uh, English diva who, who just yeah. sat. Bris Bristow, Br uh, Barstow. Uh, Dame, yes, Dame Barstow. And uh, oh, she was a great actress. Yeah. Uh, and that was, that production was the third of, of the first run. So each time we, we did it, the production was improved. We got to improve it because it was done within a space of about two years, and that was that was the best one of that production, I think. Mm -hmm. And uh, Gordon Geats to come back as a ghost, he had to 
he since he was drowned in the Seine, you remember, he had he had to get in a bathtub behind the behind the bed right. and uh, and come out dripping wet onto the stage to sing that aria and sit on his mother's lap. It was quite yeah. something. Yeah. So yeah. that was a, a brilliant libretto, Gene. Um, so in the uh, the next, then we did American Tragedy for the Met. That was that was the next piece. So I mean, it, it was it was kind of it was an amazing uh, turn of events that we wound up there for me, and uh, it was it was thrilling. I mean the, I mean the Met hat is a, uh, uh, you know, it's a challenging place to work in many ways. But of course, the the amount of talent that is brought to bear is just incredible. The orchestra, the chorus, um, and of course, the soloists that we had, you know, were just extraordinary. Uh, Susie Graham and Pat Reset, Nathan Gunn, and among others. It was just, it was really quite quite something. And it's you know, working it's, on that. Mm -hmm. I was just going to say, and I know this. The book meant so much to you because, as I remember, Tobias, you told me. That was your father's favorite book. Uh, is that right? Yes, it was my father's favorite book, and he he had an uh, a, um, first edition that he had autographed by Theodore Dreiser at a book signing from in 1925, which yeah. is the book was the book I read, yeah. and um, I dedicated it, I think, to his memory. But uh, I remember working on that with you, and um, you know the way the way our lives happen to us while we're writing an opera and all the things that are going on, we're, we're living our lives and uh, um, the ups and downs, and but we're also living inside the, the lives of our characters and yeah. in that world at the same time. And I remember that uh, we got to the church scene and we had, there had to be a hymn, it was Sunday morning church. and. Uh, and you wrote this this hymn, and uh, you know here are the the you know this these two Jewish guys, you know writing uh, this Christian hymn, and you wrote the words, and then I got them, and I said, well, I, you know I was depressed, very depressed at the time. That, you know you gave them to me. I don't know if you recall, and and I said, how how am I gonna? I can't. How do I do this? And he said, well, just this is you do this and think of it as you triumphing over this vicissitude in your life. And I, and I did, and that was, that was the, that was how I wrote the music, but can you just set up this, this scene? Because those who don't know an American tragedy, it's a very long, long old book. It was also made into a film 1951 with uh, Elizabeth Taylor, Montgomery Clift called a place in the sun. And we, this is the scene where Roberta, the, the uh, pregnant former girlfriend of Clyde uh, is threatening to expose him. Well, one, one of the things to say, and which is, uh, that pops to mind immediately is that this scene is not in the book. And you know, when you're writing an, uh, an opera libretto, you have to distill, of course, and cut, but you also have to reinvent uh, to, uh, because uh, there's, there's a different flow. It's a different way of telling a story. And there's a different flow to an opera than to a novel, which has thousands of page. And there's a the web of thought in a novel is so uh, is so complex and such a big part of the uh, of the storytelling. So I we wanted we wanted Robert, we wanted the, the pregnant right. girlfriend to con be in the same space as his the rich girlfriend that he wanted to marry, and he had this problem of of the pregnant girlfriend, and we wanted to put. Dreiser never put them in the same place. Right. At the exactly. same time, nor did, nor did the, the any of the films. Right. Right. That's that's correct. And uh, so what we did was we created this scene, and it just seemed to make sense to me. Uh, you know, Clyde, uh, this young man who is uh, am, certainly ambitious to uh, increase his social standing, falls in love with this wealthy woman. And he's making inroads with her and with the family. So they, she, he's invited to sit with them in their pew at, at, on, a, on a Sunday morning at church. And it's on this day that uh, after having threatened to do so, Roberta uh, shows up in town and now she's pregnant. She's got her suitcase. She's been told to like stay away, stay, you know, stay out of town. And he keeps lying about how he'll come and get her and 
and she says, I, I'm, I'm not going to take this anymore. And she shows up uh, in the church. She's, she's just come directly from out of town. She's carrying her suitcase. And she, she sees Clyde, this guy who uh, is the father of her, the baby she's carrying, um, uh, you know, canoodling with uh, this, uh, this wealthy young uh, socialite in the first row of the pew of the church. And uh, it seemed to me to be, it's, it's a scene of, of in the opera that I'm particularly proud of. I think it's beautiful. The music you wrote is so, uh, you did triumph over it, Tobias, because it really was, it's so, it's so, it's such a thrilling uh, chorus. And then it has this, you know, it's not just the chorus, there's this, the, there's the dramaturgical uh, aspect of this, which is this woman showing up and, and the question is, what is she gonna do? Is she gonna, is she gonna like out him uh, right there? And then, and he convinces her to stay quiet for, for a little while longer. And uh, it's, high, it's a high operatic moment of tension. It's, yeah, you know, there's just a lot of cross. I was very cross. proud of that too. But let, why don't we see this? Because we have to sure. get moving, and we'll see this clip from the church scene of American Tragedy. In those stars, Susan Graham, pa Patricia Rissette, Nathan Gunn. Right. Uh, what a trio. Yes. So yeah, that was that was um, we uh, that was American tragedy. And then uh, it needed a lot of work. Mm -hmm. So we had a very good workshop. The Met gave us a great workshop because nine years later we I think we got it right in 2000. I think so too. I'm, 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 you know, it's, I, I'm really pleased with it. And, uh, 
I think it's a really powerful American story. And uh, I, uh, I look forward to the next time it gets done because it, it's really, it's, a, it's, it's so incredibly relevant to where we are right now. You know, the haves and the have nots and the, all, the, all the stories that are, fa- the, the issues that are facing the country right now are, 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 are so beautifully illuminated in that story by Dreiser. And I think in the opera, it's just a beautiful. Yeah. I'll tell you later about something came, a, a new idea for how to produce it that came up yesterday. Oh, cool. I, I, Great. Yeah, it's exciting. So you, uh, I want to talk a little bit about your career as a songwriter, which is ju- just as illustrious uh, uh, as uh, your career as a librettist. And um, you, uh, You've written many songs that all all of the great opera singers sing and students sing. Um, you wrote uh, one song, your your American anthem, which um, you were you just were inspired to write, and uh, about twenty years ago, right? And um, I think uh, Ken, well, Ken Burns. You want to tell the story of Ken Burns um, sure. giving a call. Yeah, I, I wrote the song in uh, 1998, and uh, as you said, I was just inspired to do so. My my parents were retired school teachers, and my father was an eighth grade history teacher, a social studies teacher. And when they were selling the bed and breakfast that they had at the time, and they were just downsizing to a condo, um, they were selling their books. They had a few thousand books, and it was a big lawn sale. And there was one book that my father had used to teach. It was a young adult book called A Miracle at Philadelphia about the forming of the constitution. I read the book I, and I went home and I, and I wrote the song. And I know opera singers. I showed it to uh, Nathan, uh, Nathan Gunn. He sang it and recorded it with Kevin Murphy. And then uh, Denise Graves uh, uh, sang it, recorded it and, uh, and sort of championed the song. Her recording uh, was playing one day uh, on an NPR station in upstate New York while Ken Burns, the great filmmaker was driving through that um, part of New York. And he heard the song and he was very moved and he uh, uh, very moved and he, he wound up calling me and uh, he said, I don't know if you know who I am. I said, yes, I, I think I do know <laughs> who you are. And, uh, and he uh, was able to get uh, Nora Jones to uh, sing it for his, the doc, to use, first of all, use the, the, the music as the theme to his uh, a film called The War, which was documentary on World War II. And, uh, and then he liked the words so much that he got Nora Jones uh, to uh, sing it. And um, it's kind of the way she sang it is kind of the way I wrote it. it uh, she, uh, because I really wrote it as a sort of, a, if not a country pop tune uh, ballad and uh, very simple. And uh, I thought she did a beautiful job with it. It was a beautiful uh, rendition that I used in the film, I thought. It's very different from uh, Denise Graves sang, sang this song at Ruth Bader Ginsburg's funeral. I have to say, without, without Denise, thank you for mentioning it. And I want to mention and underscore the fact that without Denise, none of this would have happened. She has been an incredible friend and champion of the song. It's Denise who kept the song sort of alive during, uh, uh, after, after that um, film and continuing to sing it at various events for presidents and inaugurations and- uh, And, 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 De- and Denise is coming at, to at Ginsburg's- Tulsa first for our, our uh, Denise is coming to, to Graves is coming to Tulsa for our Greenwood Overcomes concert May 1st and she's, doing singing she's, a world premiere. She's extraordinary. She's an extraordinary artist, a good friend. And uh, I feel so blessed. You know, it's, it's, it is a challenging profession and we're, we're, you know, it really takes all these connections and people who stand up for you and who help you uh, along the way. And no one has helped me more in my life, uh, in my career than Denise. And uh, I, when she I, sang it at, at Ginsburg's uh, 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 memorial service, that's uh, when it is sort of advanced uh, the of the song, yeah. And, and we have a little clip from um, the, uh, the, the, the war, the Ken Burns documentary, two minute clip. And I'd like to play that for everybody, um, but uh, warn you that the, this clip contains actual footage of soldiers in World War II, and it does include some images of weapons and death. So if you don't just 
be warned. It's it's strong stuff, but it's it's so beautifully sung by Nora Jones. That is so moving. Um, I, I've seen it a few times. I practiced watching it, so I wouldn't be too choked up to talk after it. But it wasn't enough. Um, it's it's beautiful. And uh, but I uh, before we go to questions and answers, I you know something happened after that. Um, somebody was giving a speech uh, about something, and um, and they. Uh, uh, um, they made reference to this, um, to, and so maybe we could see that. Do we have that speech here, Eric? A story that might sound something like a song that means a lot to me. It's called American Anthem. And there's one verse that stands out, at least for me, and it goes like this. The work and prayers of century have brought us to this day. What shall be our legacy? What will our children say? Let me know in my heart when my days are through. America, America, I gave my best to you. Let's add, let's us add our own work and prayers to the unfolding story of our great nation. <laughs> That's amazing. I was watching, I texted you and said, did you? <laughs> This is just, just incredible. So. It was, it was incredible. I had no idea what was going to happen. I was sitting in this room and I was just absolutely, you know, gobsmacked and just, just, I was in complete shock. And then my phone exploded with friends and family calling, but I was just so moved by it that, um, that it had this, uh, that, it, that it, that it landed where it landed. It was really quite, it was quite a moment. And now it's going to be a children's book. It was just yeah, announced. a very sweet thing happened. Uh, right after that, um, a woman named Jill Santopolo, who is a uh, editor uh, at Random House at the children's division of Random House, contacted me. She does the uh, children's picture books and she has done, and she's responsible for some wonderful uh, uh, children's books, including uh, Pre Vice President Kamala Harris's children's book, Ruth Bader Ginsburg's, uh, Ginsburg's children's book, Sotomayor's children's book, Chelsea Clinton's books. So she has a very wonderful track record of taking the, uh, sort of making inspirational picture books for kids. 
And she loved the lyrics to my song. And she said uh, that she had an idea. And I think it was quite a wonderful one, not to be using my song, but she, her idea was to, and it's going to happen, was to, was to ask 13 brilliant uh, artists in the country who specialize in illustrating books. Uh, these are among the most uh, skilled and talented folks and successful folks doing this, each to uh, uh, take one, like two or three lines of the, of the song and tell something about their own family's personal, her, their own personal American story. And it's a diverse group of, uh, of American artists from all over. There's uh, an immigrant from Mexico. There's people from all uh, different walks of life. And the thing they have in common is a love for the country and, a, uh, um, and, an inc and in this case, incredible skill uh, as artists. So uh, on, it was just announced today, actually. Um, so I'm so happy I can talk about it. And um, it's gonna come out on June 29th or on time for July 4th. And it's, I will put a lead sheet at the end of the, of the book and uh, people can read it to their kids and talk about what America means to them and, and maybe sing, sing along, which will be a, a very a sweet, a sweet thing. So it was really, it was great. And it, uh, it all happened because of, um, Denise Graves singing it for uh, Justice Ginsburg's memorial service. Uh, 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 President Biden heard it then, and uh, he might have known the song before, but I, I, I can well imagine that's what really uh, put it in his uh, mind at the time of his inauguration. Was he there in the rotunda? He was there. He and Kamala Harris were there, and uh, they came up to Denise and said how much they loved the song. But he didn't say to didn't tell Denise that he was going to do what he wound up doing. So it was a complete shock uh, to me. And you know, in, in the end, honestly, Tobias, I'm sort of glad I didn't know because it's not just I wouldn't have been nervous. It was such a such an incredible thing to have the surprise of it, you know, um, and uh, and not to like plan it and put it on on social media, the whole thing, and like you know, there's time for that. I understand, but it was just but nice to be. Didn't there. need to do that. It I'm sorry. Did it, it did we didn't need to, it did it by itself. No, very but, um, So congratulations on the book and all these other things. And I know uh, our, our uh, friends will wanna ask you some questions and um, I'm gonna turn this back to Danny to go over the process for asking questions. So with that, who has a question for Tobias? Or for Jean? Oh, Susan, yes. No question, but Jean, I love you. I love you too, Susan. I have been to, I, I have been to every production, I think. And Tobias, the first time I met you was in New York. And this was so many memories tonight. So thank you, thank you, thank you so much. And John loved you. Yeah, well, you guys were great. I should yeah. just, I should fill in uh, the viewers. Yeah, I used to perform, you know, as mm -hmm. I mentioned, I, and when I came back to the States after my time in Europe, I was yeah. performing in Gilbert and Sullivan and I did many, many jobs with the Colorado Symphony. And in I Central City Opera, through, right. right. I, stayed with, I stayed with Susan and got to know her and John and right. uh, very, very dear friends. So yeah, a long time since I've seen you. So it's lovely to see you. Uh, happy to see you. I love you. So we have any questions for Jean? Great, Nicole, what's your question? Um, hey, so uh, are you excited about your new book coming out soon? I am, I'm just like, I'm, I'm, I'm over the moon. I just can't, I can't quite believe that this is not something I was uh, planning. Also, can I just say for those of you who actually write books, I, it's done. I wrote the song. So it's not only is the book coming out, but I don't, I just, they're, they're, it's up to the artists now and the publisher to uh, put something together. But it really is a thrill. And you know, whatever happens with the book in terms of whether it sells or something, it's an incredible keepsake. And it marks a, um, a moment in my life. You know, I, I wrote this song 20, over 20 years ago. And, uh, and you know, without be becoming too mushy, you know, lost my both my parents over the last few years and this was something that they knew well the song and loved it and uh so there, it, it feels connected to them as well so there, there's a um on many on many fronts it's really a great thing and uh, as i said it really is, it marks a moment in my life in a, in a really profound and fun way honestly just fun 
Okay, this question came in chat from Reggie. While you are writing the libretto, do you do it alone or do you sometimes work with the composer? And how do you as a librettist handle it if you don't agree? And Tobias, I'd love for you to chime in on how you handle it as a composer if you don't agree. Well, I'm gonna to start that question backwards, uh, answer it backwards. Uh, the comp you know, in the end, it doesn't matter if the text is some sort of platonic notion of the, of the perfect form, the perfect text or whatever. It has to inspire music. It has to inspire the composer. And if it doesn't, um, uh, it's not the right text uh, for the moment because it's, this is not about someone speaking the text. It's about the music. I, you know, I believe uh, the text matters enormously, obviously. I'm a librettist. And, and the storytelling and the dramaturgy matters enormously. But we come to the opera because of the unique experience of hearing music express what's in our hearts. And it needs to do that. So if a composer says, I don't get this, uh, this just doesn't work for me. And Tobias has told me this over the over the years. Like you know, I have to rework something. That's that's part of that's part of the gig. That's part of the job. Uh, in terms of working at the the words come first um, uh, in, in an opera. They always have. But there's so much back and forth. With uh, I'm I'm a I'm a big outliner. I write very large you know detailed outlines much of which people never see. It's just in my, the process. But I'm always talking to the composer. Tobias and I went over everything uh, in Therese and in American Tragedy, uh, um, just you know, in terms of how the story would be told. And we would go back and forth and, and that's, uh, that's part of the dance of it. But it has to inspire music. And uh, that's, that's the job of the librettist is to tell the story in a way so that I always say that music is the marrow of the matter. It's the, it's the center of this whole experience. And, um, and one of my concerns with, you know, with modern opera frequently is that it wants to be, or it frequently is nowadays, uh, uh, scripts set to music, as opposed to opera librettos, which inspire music. Because that's what we really, that's, that's why, at least in my mind, that's why we're, uh, that's why we do what we do. And that's why, you all come to the operas to hear the great, great singing and great, great music, I think. Yeah, well, um, I don't, if we ever, I don't remember having any big disagreements about text. If I wanted something changed, we talked about it and, uh, and you had a solution. Or um, I also, the, mu the words, the music for me uh, flows from the words, but sometimes the music does come first. Yeah. When I got the text of the ghost aria that you gave me, I, uh, it made me think of something I'd written years before uh, for my um, for a piece. And uh, I, I actually retrofit, you may remember the yeah. words to, to my cello concerto that's in my cello concerto too. I retrofit the it, it was if as if the music um, had I don't know the words somehow worked perfectly with that music as if they were well they were married completely. But some sometimes music does come first, and you can put the words into the music, and that's uh, it's also also m m very exciting for me when I can set words that that I'm given that without any changes, without asking for any changes, just, I know that Strauss was very excited in with his, the libretto that Stefan Zweig gave him for Streig Sommerfrau, because he said, I didn't have to change a single word. Mm -hmm. And, uh, and your librettos, I, you know, I don't, I don't remember changing words. Maybe we did. One the words I remember, I honestly, I remember just one, I don't even remember what it was, but I remember I had a different opening to act two of Therese. And I remember you saying that, you know, we, we talked about it and, and just, I don't even remember what it was at this point, it's so long ago. But you know, th that's part, but that's part of the, that's part of the process, you know, that's, uh, that's how Well, it that's, the, that's the joy of the collaboration. That's the joy of it. That's, I mean, you think about, we're, we spend so much in doing what we do, composing, writing libretti, it's, there's so much time alone. The best part of this is the collaboration and hanging out and, uh, you know, and it's just so much, that's the fun, that's the, the, the fun, the doing it together. I love that. Well, the collective I, when I was blocked, you would, 
Yeah. You would say, let's go for a bike ride and right. we'd ride Chelsea Piers and yep. get, get ice cream. Yep. <laughs> yes, indeed. So. I have a question. Um, what, in a story, what inspires you to think, oh, this should be an opera? What gets you excited in a story to make it an opera? Uh, for me, it's usually a, um, it's, it's hard to like pinpoint it, except to say that for me, it's usually a very intimate story with very large ramifications. It's because I think opera is usually best, uh, so Dickens is not a, I love Dickens, he's one of my favorite writers, but he's not, a, it's not really good source material for an opera. It's too, it's these picaresque, large, you know, uh, uh, stories, it, a, a central conflict that's almost like a stone being dropped in a pond, but then it ripples out, you know. In this case, like with American Tragedy, you know, it's a story about uh, this guy, he gets this, this young woman pregnant, he falls in love with this socialite and, and he has to figure out what to do and, and horrible things happen. But it's about class, it's about society, it's about America, it's about, not just about ambition, but it's about, it's about so many different, uh, 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 things that are essential to the American story. And so, but it's a, but, but on, a, but if you distill it down, it's a very simple story of a love triangle, right? And uh, that's true of Therese Rican as well. And so I think, uh, uh, when, when, and in the Therese story, it's really the, the ramifications are all the psychological, how do you live with the choices that you make and so forth. So it's, I think those are the, those are the things that really get me uh, excited. Uh, uh, you know about uh, about an, about a source for an, for an opera or creating a story something that's very very slight but that that had that echoes and just the echoes just go and go and go. For me, it's you 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 know it, they say of writers they write you write what you know and for me I I can only write about characters that who I know who I understand and who who's who I identify with. So, um, and the longer you live, the more, the more you understand people. Mm -hmm. Well, it's been nice to share this time with you and uh, to see Tobias. Oh, I, and uh, happy to answer anything, but uh, I do, I do want to say how much I appreciate the chance to chat with you, to reconnect with Tobias and see these, a lot of familiar faces on these, on these little cubes, which is great. I want to say hi. Hi, Arie. <laughs> hi. Hi, Susan. All these hey, nice it's, way. So, it's, it's lovely. It's lovely to reconnect. Uh, Jean, thank you so much for doing this, dear friend. And um, and uh, it, this was a re really special, I don't use that thank term, uh, occasion for me. And uh, I will I look, you, look forward to talking to you soon. Thank you. Thank My you, Jean. Pleasure. And um, yeah, and um, please come back for our, our next uh, conversation on April 6th uh, when Susan Graham joins us. Um, uh, and, um, and I want to thank you all uh, for joining us and, and being a part of this conversation, letting us reminisce. Bravo. Thank you. Thank you, thank you so much, folks. Thank you.